Hi, everyone. From the Ford Ladies community, I am Griselda Togobo in conversation with a very special guest today. Um, we have the singular pleasure of having Linda Plant uh, with us today. Some of you are here because you've seen her as the Queen of Mean, dubbed by the media as the Queen of Mean, and, and one of the final interviewers for uh, Alan Sugar's Apprentice of the Year. Some of you are also here because you know she's a fantastic, inspirational woman. She's an entrepreneur. She's one of the most supportive, kindest people I know in my network. And you know I have a, a large network. So today, she's giving me the permission to ask her anything um, that we want to know as a community to see how she did it, how she didn't do it, her successes as well as her failures. So if you have any questions before we get started, please make sure to type them into the chat box. So if you're listening to this conversation later on, just know that it was recorded before a live audience and you can sign up and see and be part of the next interview at forwardladies.com. So Linda, thank you so much for making time for us and welcome um, to today's In Conversation With. Thank you, Griselda. <laughs> so Linda, I know you started from very humble beginnings in Yorkshire, Leeds, where I'm actually currently based. And we know the story that you started with the market store and eventually you had your company listed on the stock exchange. Yes. So what I really want to know is how you started. What was that first venture? Well, the first venture was really helping my mother on the market stall. And when I used, I couldn't wait, I used to go on a Saturday um, because the market saw was only two days a week. It was Wednesday and Saturday. And I couldn't wait for Saturdays to come round so I could go and stand behind the store helping my mother sell stockings. Um, and when I was in Dewsbury Market, there were stalls. The stall next to us was selling jewellery. And there was a stall further down selling handbags. They were very, very busy. And I used to think, oh, one day I'd love to sell jewellery and handbags. Um, time went on and we got the opportunity to get uh, a stall, a full-time stall. My mother was a secretary and my father was a tailor in those days in a company called Montague Burton's and we had very little money. But we got an opportunity to get a stall in a full, in a market in Sheffield. Um, now there was no Brent Cross or Westfield in those days. There was no, the nearest thing to an indoor shopping centre was this <clears throat> market in Sheffield and it was open six days a week and it had two floors and it had stalls selling everything and it was all covered in and we got an opportunity to get a stall in that market and it was a huge, I call it an opportunity because that's exactly how I saw it at a very young age but many might, may see that as a risk and it was a risk because my mother had to give up her job in the synagogue, in the working as a secretary. Uh, and we had, to, we had to borrow money because we knew that as a full-time stall, it was only small. We couldn't just sell ladies stockings because it wouldn't be enough. You couldn't turn over enough. So the truth is my father was quite go ahead. My mother was more, she worried more. She was, my father and I were very good. And me, I was, there was no doubt at that very young age, we have to take this store. So we took this store, we borrowed money off my grandfather, who was an immigrant from Austria. And actually that was a pressure because my grandfather also was not a rich man. So borrowing the money to buy stock was a pressure on us because we couldn't, you know, we, we knew we had to try and pay him back. Anyway, we forged ahead, we got the store, and then the dream came true because what should we sell? We sold jewelry and we sold handbags because you could buy handbags in Manchester. There was a lot of wholesalers there and we bought it and we opened our first store. And I used to go on a Saturday and I couldn't wait to leave school. And as many of you know, I left school at 15, six, 15 and a half, my mother, and my mother never even said to me, continue with an education. And even if she would have done, I wouldn't have. My education was the education of life, of working, starting from home in a market store. The market store was very successful. It grew from one to three to five 
along the way, as you know, uh, I got married. I met my I met my first husband, and uh, he was a hairdresser. But by the time I met him, we'd got three stalls, and we were doing quite nicely. And um, I was very driven and motivated. I still am today, all those yeah. years later. I am. And uh, the the stall grew, um, and then we moved into ladies' fashions. So from the three stalls selling, we have three stalls selling handbags and jewellery in Sheffield. We then moved to Rotherham, to Doncaster, to Bradford, and we had 14 stalls. And I'm going to touch on this now because... I've had a lot of questions about business in challenging times. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, and I've lived through three challenging times. We're now approaching the fourth, but I lived through a three day week. Not many people will, maybe some will, maybe some won't, but we had a a government where we only had, we only had daylight three, three days a week. So we had to do all our business in those days because we had the miners were on strike we mm-hmm. had we had no electricity and it was very challenging very challenging so um anyway the business grew as you know and then we got into wholesale um because i took i took a warehouse when i had 13 stop shops and stores we needed a central distribute distribution and i took it in the fashion area of leeds and we'd bring the stock back from London and we'd distribute it. And then someone walked in one day and said, do you sell this stock? And I never say no, if I can say yes, I always say that. And I said, well, yes, we do, we can. And from that, the wholesale business was born because I moved the distribution to a backwater place in Leeds and opened a showroom, got a guy to run it for me, called it Trendsetters, and then just went to London and I had 13 shops, 14 shops, and then I had a big wholesale. So I had quite a nice business and I had a husband and I think I might have had my first baby by that time. So um, that was, and then as I say, one of the biggest turning points in my life, I had a Chinese friend and he said, Linda, why don't you, would you like to go to Hong Kong? I've got an associate and he's an agent, a, a, a quota holder, because in those days we would, for Freeman's mail order. And he's got a lot of quota. Freeman's have opened their own office. He's looking for, he's looking for, a, he's looking for someone to sell his quota to. He says, and I know uh, knitwear has been my passion. Fashion, style, it's gone on to style and homes and through, through the years. But my passion was knitwear and I never thought I could really buy the knit where I loved. So I thought, well, what have I got to lose? A ticket to Hong Kong. So by that time, I mean, I always look at opportunity versus risk, but there is always risk. But the, yeah. to me, there was very, there was big risk taking the first step. There was very little risk taking a ticket to Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. I flew to Hong Kong, met with the agent, and he took me around a lot of factories. And I'm quite, creative i'm not a trained designer but i've got a great eye so by the end of we took me around to all these factories and i saw lots of styles that i loved and i decided and this is very very important is in my course which i'll talk about later you've got to have a usp a unique selling point in business um especially in a trading business so you've got to know you can't be jack of all trades master of none so i knew I wanted to buy, I wanted a handwriting, my own handwriting. Now I'm, I like everything commercial. So I wanted pretty knitwear. I could never buy the knitwear that I really in in my head wanted to buy. So I thought, right, I'm going to make this range and I'm going to embroidery and flowers and things. And I put this range together and it was so lovely. And I thought to myself, I've got to brand this because it needs its own identity. It's USP. The USP was the handwriting. It was pretty, it wasn't random. It had a definite handwriting. And it had a handwriting that appealed to a wide market because mm-hmm. I do like to have a wide market. market. You know, I thought, well, a lot of women like pretty things, don't they? And really, whether you're, I don't know, what, it's a big age group. Yeah. So I branded it. 
honeysuckle because I wanted the, the brand name to represent and I brought the merchandise back. So I wasn't really thinking how big an importing business I could have. I was thinking I've bought 2,000, 2,500 of style. I know I can sell these mm-hmm. between my wholesale and my retail. But when I brought, the, when I brought all the samples back and uh, hung them up, the customers and when are they coming in when are they coming in when are they coming in and um i could see very quickly that this was something that could be developed yeah um and i don't know if i told this story before so i went back to hong kong for the winter range which was knitwear ladies knitwear because the first range i did was t-shirts and sweatshirts it wasn't really knitwear and my agent um said to me we have to go to Seoul, Korea, uh, because that's where they have a lot of the quotas and that's where they're making knitwear. So off we go to Seoul, Korea. Uh, <laughs> so one, brave of you, Linda. You're right. I was bloody brave. <laughs> one hotel. When I got there, I thought, what is this place? It was so gloomy, gloomy and miserable. One hotel um, and curfew. We said, I didn't really have to worry. There was nowhere to go, but you had to be, it was scary. You had to be off the streets at 8.30 at night. You could still hear gunfire on the borders. So it was, anyway, I forgot about the fear when I went to the knitwear factories. Um, And people asked me, you know, so the first turning point in, in my career was actually going to Hong Kong, building, starting a brand. But the second one, was I walked into a factory and I saw these amazing sweaters. It was like, if I saw them today, I would love them. They were sweaters with beads and diamantes and ribbons and everything fantastic. And I said to the factory owner, I want to buy these sweaters. He said, no, 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 you can't have these sweaters because these sweaters are for an American Korean called Maria Kim. So I said, well, I don't want them for America. I want them for England. He said, no, no, you can't have them. I said, well, let me meet her. No, she's in New York. So he said to me, but her husband's here. So, well, let me meet him. Oh, no, because I started off in very much a non-forward ladies world. I started off in the world where it was forward men and Korea. Just to put it in perspective, in Korea, a woman could not work once she was married yeah. and the children always belong to the husband's family. They don't belong to the mother. So this was, this was a difficult, this was a, they'd never seen a woman really in business. And here's me saying, well, let me meet him. Anyway, luckily, as there was only one hotel uh, and he was staying in it as well, he agreed to give me 30 minutes the next morning at breakfast. And I thought, what am I going to say to this man to convince him that I can sell all these sweaters and to give me the rights to the sweaters? Um, And I thought, well, best policy, I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to paint some ridiculous picture. I'm a big importer. I wasn't. I just thought it. So I sat down and I said to him, look, I can't deliver dinner at breakfast, but I'm a small business. I'm a new business. But... What I can tell you is, I think I can sell these sweaters. Um, I really think I can do a good job. And um, I want you to give me the rights for England. And I thought I'll throw in Europe as well, because I may as well. Because you may as well. (laughs) Well, uh, you know. um, Think big. Yeah. Well, I've always, you've got to think big. Not unrealistically big, but. So anyway, um, he started, we had a ratchet. And he, I can't quite remember, he said, I want X percentage royalties on each sweater. Uh, and I thought, well, I'm not going to argue on that. I said, OK, but if I sell Y, I want you to lower it. And if I sell Z, I want you to lower it again. Anyway, the bottom line is, I, 30 minutes later, I had the deal. I had the rights to England and I had the rights to Europe. And I, I put together my first knitwear range. Um, and it was so fabulous. It, it was so fabulous. If I had it today, and I've still got my old catalogs, I would love it today. And amongst that range, amongst this range, was about 12 or 14 of these sweaters, which I redid to fit the European market, market. a little bit. And 
anyway, I, I, to make a long story, I, I took a stand at the London Fashion Fair because I felt that with these kind of, with this knitwear range, just staying in Leeds, I wouldn't have the exposure. I thought I need to go to a fashion show, a fashion show and let everyone see my goods. So I took this tiny stand. And I, as you know, I've said it before, I, I, I could have drowned in success because I had so many, I had every multiple in the country and I had CNA, which was a store yeah, group, and yeah. then Germany and Holland. Anyway, I finished up selling 300,000 of those sweaters alone. Wow. That was, and I always say that was probably one of the turning points, Point. the memorable things in my career. Yeah. yeah. So um, let, let's go back to the start, you know, because I okay. know this is something a lot of women struggle with. We almost start with a deficit and mindset where you think, I don't have enough qualifications. I just need to go and get another one. Um, I don't have enough of this. I don't have enough of that. But you started off having decided not to carry on with school and you felt, you still felt confident enough to be yeah. So what was it that gave you that mindset? Because a lot of people are just trying to get more because they don't feel they're good enough. Well, I don't have a single qualification to my name, only the qualifications of life. But you know, qualifications doesn't always equal success. Yeah. Now, I had a business brain and um, I was motivated and driven and I really had not much to lose. And yes, you know, so I said I saw it as an opportunity, but there's risks, but you have to calculate the risk. You have to be prepared to take a risk or seize an opportunity, whichever way you want to look at it. Now, you know, not everyone is business minded, not everyone is entrepreneur minded. I am, and I was. Um, and I still would say today, it doesn't matter if you're starting, if you haven't got qualifications, but you've got a good idea or you've got a business brain, have a go. Because what, you know, what's the worst if you fail? You know, if you fail, I say, the failure can set you up for the next, the next success. It can teach you things. So how much, how much importance do I attach to qualifications? Well, if you want to be a doctor, I attach a lot of importance <laughs> to qualifications. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you better have a you better have a good business brain, a vision. You better have drive and motivation, and understand what it takes to build a business. Yeah. And you do need a little bit of understanding or getting outside people to advise you on the financial side because that does come into play. But do I think you need qualifications if you want to be an entrepreneur? Not really. No, you don't. No. So, so another thing you touched on, so you all started in the market store. Yeah. I suspect some people stayed in a market store and you yes. got out. Yes. What do you think you did differently that well, opened up the world to you? Well, I just wanted, there was never any thought of not forging ahead. So like I said, when I had the market stores, I had 13 of them, but then when I didn't intentionally decide to open a wholesale, but I took a distribution center in the wholesale area. And when someone came in and said, do you sell these to other shops? It, there was never a doubt in my mind. Yes, why don't I? Yes. So that, so because that's it. If I get an idea, I grab it. Yeah, why don't I? So, and I knew actually, it wasn't some random thing. It, I could do it within the fold of what I was doing. I was yes. already buying stock. I already, so all I did was buy more. And the more I bought, the cheaper I could buy. So therefore, not only could I service my own shops, but I could sell to other shops. And yes. that's how I grew that. And then when I got the opportunity to go to Hong Kong, Hong Kong I didn't go, oh no. no. I thought, yes, why don't I go to Hong Kong? Yes. That's not something you can teach, maybe. It's in you, you know, to seize that. But that's how, that's how I grew. It's just chasing the opportunities when you see them and rather yes. than talking yourself out of it. There are so many reasons why you shouldn't have gone to Hong Kong then. You had a thriving business. You had three kids. You just got married or da 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 I had two then, not three. Two then. So let's go to the children. You have three children. 
I do. I am very impressed and inspired mm-hmm. by women who have lots of children and <laughs> still carry on without mm-hmm. losing momentum because I have two of my own and I can yeah. tell you since COVID and homeschooling, yeah. I, my hat's off goes to you. My hat goes yeah. off to these women. I don't know so, if I could done, I could <laughs> build the business quicker than homeschooling, I think. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But, so sorry. I know every time we have these conversations, there are people on the call who think that you know, I want to do all these things, but I feel really held back by the family situation, you know, by the children, by the caring for other people. Well, so I think you in, do it in the, well, in those days, it was much more today. Women are at the forefront of business. You've got husbands yeah. staying home and women working. But in those days, um, so I was lucky. Well, my husband didn't travel with me. Uh, so... I had my husband at home with the children and luckily my mother and father, because I traveled for long periods of time, five, six weeks. I mean, eventually I had an office in Hong Kong and I would travel for five, six weeks very often. The, the biggest, my biggest worry, it was because when I was with my children, I had quality time. It was the guilt I felt while every mother was dropping their children off at school and picking them up and there to make them afternoon tea and dinner and breakfast and be everything. I was working, but I, but I can tell you this much, that my kids, uh, my kids had an incredible respect for me. And when they grew yeah. up, as most kids do when they grow up, well, they go off and have their own lives and they're like home because mum's a housekeeper or whatever. But really and truthfully, would I say working, my mother worked when I was a little girl. Yeah. Right, and it and it showed me how to become capable. It sh- we lived in different times then, but it certainly taught me. I had to learn things. I had to do things. Yeah. And my kids, I do not think that me working uh, had any negative effect on them. In fact, I would say a positive effect because they were very proud of me. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so, so, Linda. Um, that we have so many questions coming in now. Um, mm. There's a question around juggling time with children. I think a lot of people are struggling to do that. So how did you do, how did you juggle? Did you have to so, juggle at all? Well, I did. Of course you have to juggle if you're a mother. Um, so the point is that when I was home, uh, when I traveled, I was away. Uh, when I was home, I had quality time with the kids. So I worked every day, even when I was home, but the weekends we had with the kids and holiday times. We always took holidays at Christmas because I could afford to after I'd you know, done well. In we took holidays at Christmas, holidays at Easter. And I always, I mean, when I would go away in the summer, look, I would answer email. Well, there were no emails in those days. It was texts or whatever it was, telex things. But, um, I gave my kids quali- quality, I gave them quality time. They knew they were loved. And I think that's important. Children are a lot more resilient than people give yeah. them credit for. They really are. Um, and my kids, my boys, uh, they, you know, they, they, I, 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 I just felt guilty that I was traveling, but really and truly I knew I gave them the love and they've grown up to be great boys. Yeah. Great boys. So so there's the same my husband has. Every time I'm busy, he tells me more money, more problems. It's his joke. Um, anytime I'm stressed. He's like, I told you more money, more problems. But I don't believe it's more money, more problems. I, I think one of the skills we need to develop as women is the ability to get other people on board to do the work with us. Yes. So building a team is such a core skill that women should be uh, developing. It's not really about doing everything yourself. It's how do you build a team around you to facilitate some of the things you want to achieve? Well, you how can't, do you do you, that? look, you can't, you can't. I mean, there are some businesses that are one man bands, but you really, when you start to grow a business, team building is so important or relationships. There are two things that are very, very important. Now, the truth is, if you want to grow a business, you do have to bring on board people and you have to bring on board people that are motivated and driven to begin with. And then I think you have to reward those people. You have to make those people feel part of your business. You know, I always, I employed people that I could see were motivated and driven and excited. And I believe 
that I believe that if people get results, they should be rewarded and they should feel part of what you're doing. That's how you build a team. You build a team because that's exactly what you are. You're a team. Mm -hmm. Now, you might be the I might be the head of the team. I might be where the buck stopped. But nevertheless, I had a team and I delegated and I'm a, I'm a meetings person. I'm not a boardroom person. I am a meetings person. I like meeting round a table, discussing, getting on with things. And that's how I built a team. And that's how I built relationships. And that's how in the second challenging time of my career was in 1986 or 85, when I was buying millions of US dollars worth of merchandise because all my merchandise I bought in US dollars. And the pound went to 105 against the dollar. And I was buying, I mean, I, I did a cap usually, but I was buying all this merchandise and it just dropped. It dropped dramatically. And I thought, what am I going to do? Because I cannot just put all my prices up ridiculously because I'm not going to be able to sell it to the customers. So I have to think of a way. I have to find a middle road. And I got on the plane. I went to the Far East and I saw my key suppliers that I had relationships with. And I said, now it's time we have to work together because I'm buying in US dollars. Things I can't put these up 30%. You have to help me. You have to bring the prices down to help me. And I brought my prices up a bit but those are that's because I had relationships with people and yeah. those relationships you have to go the good with the bad and you have to take it together and we work I like to work with the same people I like to team build and I like to relationship build yeah and I guess you can take that into all walks of life business and even personal life you yeah. know comes times in your personal life you need friends you need relationships so you have to value relationships and build your team in business and value them and make them feel valued. Yeah. So there's a question that has just come through from Rachel. Rachel says she runs a successful cleaning business that tends over 3.5 million and she wants to take it to the next level and grow bigger. What advice do you have to give it? Well, she has to have a plan. She, right. Well, she has to have a plan and she has to have a strategy. And I'd have to know more about her business. But I would say that you must, the growth has got to be realistic. You know, sometimes on The Apprentice, I get these business plans. <laughs> and, you know, the, the candidates, maybe they've got a business and it's making quite a nice profit. It might be making 30,000, 40,000. And then suddenly they tell me, oh, if I get Lord Sugar's investment, I'm going to make 1.3 million. So, and I go, well, how are you going to do that? Show me how. So if she wants to make her business bigger, she's got to have a strategy. Where will her growth come from? The growth needs to be scaled. Will can she financially support that growth? Because it's very, very important. And that's, we're not talking about it now, but that's why I've gone on to do this academy because so many people don't understand, you know, if she's got a turnover of three and a half million, she's already understands her business. But to take it to the next level, you know, you've got to understand when I grew my business, my importing business, I couldn't have grown it without when I went to Hong Kong, it's a very different business because you need that letters of credit and you need a lot of finance. Now, luckily, the quota holder was also prepared to give me finance. Mm -hmm. But the fine, you have to be able to do your financial template to understand how much are you going to need. If you can take your business from this to this, what's going to be the cost? Can you support it? And then the areas, where is the growth? Because there is, there, I'm sure there is growth, but it's got to be controlled and strategized. Yeah. That's what I would advise to her. Definitely do it. Go for it. You know, uh, I remember interviewing one girl and she had a, a business and she, she was in a, uh, somewhere in the Midlands. But the next thing she wanted to do was open a London office. She hadn't actually conquered where <laughs> she was, you know, so be realistic, but yes, definitely take it to the next level. I knew more about her business than I would advise. 
Yes. Okay. In more so, so there's been a question around motivation. So you have been consistent starting businesses, pushing yourself through failure, starting another one, yeah. exiting, exiting, starting another one. Even now, um, whilst doing the apprentice through COVID, when everybody is taking shelter, you have launched an academy. Yes. What is your driving force? But drive, I think, is within you. Um, I'm always, I'm never bored. I'm always excited. Um, I want, I'm I'm, I'm positive as well. And I've moved through the fashion business, through electronics business, through property, through interior design. And um, so I, it's it's kind of it's always been trading in a way because even yeah. when I'm trading multi million pound houses, I'm still trading them. Um, so I, you know, I don't think you can say if you're not a motivated person. Oh, how do I get motivated? That's that's a difficult one. But if you are motivated, think of the positives. Think where you can go, and just don't be afraid to fail. You know, yeah, think yeah. positive because. And I've said this a couple of times, 1929 was one of the biggest depressions, but what came out of it? Disney. Disney yeah. came out mm -hmm. of 1929. 2008, when the wheel fell off with the banks and the mortgage, mortgage companies, Airbnb was born. Yeah. So out of recession and out of depression can come positivity. And we have to stay positive in life. We have yeah. to think, yes, we can. And if we fail, well, we'll pick ourselves up. It's not going to kill us. Fantastic. So I, I think the question also is, if I can add my two pairs, it's around, if you're not motivated, it's because you've not found the thing that you're passionate about. And Linda, as you can see, is a very passionate person about style, about <laughs> yeah, well, trading. I, yes. In my course, I do because, and especially in these times, I say to people, how to get an idea. So if you're not motivated, I actually, I'm not going to, might not tell you on this because you might have to buy my course, but I actually explain this how, woman here. how you get an idea. Because if you think I want to do it, I want to go into business. What do I do? Because I start off with how to get an idea and I end up with how to carry on in challenging, difficult times. So the truth is, if you're not motivated, you've got to get, and you've got to get yourself motivated, you've got to get an idea. Yeah. So there's a, a question here around moving between industries. So I know a lot of people tend to stick to what they know. Um, I, similar to you, I started an account, um, engineering went into accounting. I'm always looking for that thing that makes me a lot happier because I think life is so boring already. Why do things <laughs> that you're not enjoying? You know, I have to do things that get me out yes. of bed you went from um the stall and fashion you went into design you went into property and went you, into electronics got, electronics you've gone into all these sectors which apart from the fashion even fashion is male dominated looking at the e-commerce businesses now <laughs> they are all male dominated so there's a question here around how you thrive in a male dominated space. And I know if there's any woman who holds her own. It well, is women, you. look, let's be honest. Women can do so much more than men. Men are like one, they can do one thing. Women have to do everything. But how to thrive? Well, today it's easy to thrive because women are at the forefront. Um, in those days, uh, I never, you know, I never thought about it. And in some ways, in some ways, being a woman was an, was an advantage. And I always say this, you know, I'm, I'm aggressive, but I'm softly aggressive. I don't believe if you can't, if, if you're not going to get something nice and a little bit, you know, use a little bit of femininity, it can work. You know, you don't always have to be rough or tough. When I'm negotiating, and that yes. can be through all my businesses, through the fashion businesses, I was negotiating. Through my electronics business, I was negotiating. Through the property business, you know, you sit down and when you negotiate, I always like, you have to assess who you're negotiating with. Sometimes it's nice to bring a bit of personal into it, a little bit of warmth before your negotiation. It sometimes just gets things moving a bit. And 
maybe that hasn't answered how you thrive in a male dominated world and maybe it has <laughs> because actually if you're a woman you can use a bit of that femininity i think it's far better to be um you might be you might you might have a boxing glove on but you could wrap it in velvet and it gets you further <laughs> fantastic okay <laughs> so let's talk about relationships so I, I I know a lot of people and, you know, a, a lot of people on this call know a lot of people, but we don't tend to nurture those relationships as much as we should because we have almost been taught that go on and find the next relationship and make your network bigger. Well, are you talking, look, are you, are you, I'm hopeless with men. So if you're talking about no, 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 men. <laughs> business relationships. Oh, I'm good with those. I'm just yes. So, yes. So when <laughs> I met you, one of the things I remember, Linda, really? is that one January, I got an email from you and you said in your email that Griselda, happy new year and what can i do to support you this year and i was shocked because i had never received an email from anyone asking me how i was doing or what they can do to support me so that made me oh. just i've never forgotten you because of that and and genuine and true to your word you've always kept in touch and reached out and and you're the more, one of the most genuine people i know thank you so much thank you what do you what is it how did you get to that point have you always been like that or was there a point where you decided that actually it doesn't matter who i meet or how successful they are but i need to keep the people i already know um and treat them well well i think it's very important along my along along the way and even from my days in the fashion business i mean my head designer i'm still best friends we have lunch once a month i think nurture relationships because and i had i had two sides of relationships because i had my suppliers who were so important the lifeline to my business but i had the customers now they were very important and you want to get repeat business yeah. you want those customers to come back so it's very important whatever field you're going into if you're and, and you know mine was trading so with trading suppliers are important and customers are important but i think it's very very important to, uh, to nurture those relationships and that goes back to what i really said before so i always try and bring a little bit of personal and you know i am a genuinely upbeat positive person yeah. i'm not some negative person putting on a smile i am positive and in a way think i've reached a stage now where i can give back a bit you yeah. know when i can give back and i think you know why not why not someone asked me a question the other day can someone be too rich it wasn't about me <laughs> and i said and i said the following well i said if you're bill gates no, because he is super rich, but look what he's giving back, yeah. you know, and I think that, but, but it's so important in life because relationships are important. Yeah. They're valuable. They're very valuable. They're valuable in business and they're valuable in your life. But mine are no good with men, but with everything <laughs> else, they're good. <laughs> that's another, I think that would be another session. That's an, yeah, no, yeah, I think that's another whole other, um, my mom used to tell me why do you Wait, hang it let me just jump why don't you be the one doing the dumping first um and that's always stayed with me so i i think a lot of people you know are trying to find their path throughout the covid and to get back to business as usual you have remained positive you've been exercising i've seen exile on instagram oh. <laughs> how have you you know kept yourself so mentally grounded and sound throughout this period well i wrote a business course which kept me very busy i wanted to do it for a long time and it wasn't it, it wasn't it just came to me in covid but i was locked down um as you know now i'm in the property business uh, which is not a business that you need to work every day full time yeah. Yeah. it's different business and in any case um so and we couldn't really do any interior the, the interior design side couldn't really work so i thought um i'll write this business course that i wanted to write um and of course during during well i mean we're still in challenging times we are yeah. still in challenge yeah. but i've always been positive someone said to me linda you're not going to get the virus i'd be afraid to attack you <laughs> i believe um, that but i i exercise i exercise 
and uh, as soon as we could have friends round, I did, and I had my my son actually moved in with me. I oh, loved wow. it. He hated me, but anyway, he did. <laughs> um, no, so we have to keep positive, and I just cited that out of very challenging times came Disney, came Airbnb, yeah. came FedEx. Came, you've got to think positive, and it's not always easy. Yeah, it's really not. You have to try because, you know, the, you have to just try to keep your chin up, try to think positive, try to think what you can do. And exercise, I mean, look, I hate exercise, but I do it. I mean, so I, I think you have a personal trainer that kicks yeah. your ass, isn't it? Well, yeah, well, I do. Oh, my God. And I suffer. With, I've had a bad back. And uh, I do it, in, and then my, once my friend could come, we do it together. We both hate it and moan about it, but you feel good after it. So, yes, you do. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the academy. Um, yeah. What's the building blocks in the academy, and why should people go and check okay. it out and sign up? So I decided, um, I thought about it for a long time, and I thought, I want to write a business course, because... After all, I've had quite a varied career. I've had the fashion business, the electronics business. Um, I thought I'm qualified. And I'm qualified to write a business course for people who aren't quali who've got no qualifications. So here, I'm, here I am, and I've had reasonable success, and I've got no qualifications, but I can write a business course that is a, like a story. It's actually the true grit of business. So I've written 12 chapters, mm -hmm. starting with actually, how do I get an idea to start a business? I want to be in business, how do I get an idea? Right through to um, negotiating, to team building, right through to being in business in challenging times. And in every chapter, I, I write a personal anecdote about if it's team building, how I use team building in my businesses. So in yeah. every chapter, there's a story about how, I, how I've done it. And I touch on everything because I have evolved. And yeah. I, you know this. I went, I, I went on The Apprentice at 60 years old. Yes, and, tell me about you know, that one. How did that happen? Well, I, got a, I, I met Alan Sugar um, probably... Uh, in the in i met him oh 20 30 years ago when he had amstrad and i had honeysuckle and he would travel in the far east and i would see him in korea um and i wasn't socially i didn't i wasn't social but i became quite friendly with him um and he has a home in florida where i have a son who lives in florida and my son is quite friendly with him and I've had dinner with him and I've seen him, I know him. And then out of the blue, he called me and he said, I need a new interviewer for The Apprentice. I want someone who's going to really dig deep and expose weaknesses. And, you know, Alan's quite, can you do it? I said, I don't know. But then I've never known what I could do anyway. But I, I've never known. I thought, can I do it? I don't know. I've never been on television before. The first talk I gave for you, I've never done a talk. So yes. I... Um, I thought, well, I'll have a go. And he sent me, he said, I'll put you in touch with the BBC and Boundless, the production company. They sent me a mock script. I went for the audition. Uh, I was a bit nervous at first because, you know, you, I'd never been in a studio and I had a mock candidate. But once I started interviewing her and I knew what he wanted, I was just so focused on digging holes in what she'd written. <laughs> I forgot, I forgot all about the cameras and everything else. And I, you know, went laid into her. And, uh, and then I went on The Apprentice. And of course, my brief, I knew what he wanted. He wanted, he didn't want someone. Claudine tells them how lovely they are and <laughs> how's your children and how's your mother and your brother and your father. He didn't want that from me. He wanted me to look at that business plan and say, well, no, this is rubbish. This isn't true. How are you going to get from 50,000 to 1.4 million? Where's your figures? And that's what I do. But yeah. I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not mean to them just for the sake of it. I don't mean to be mean. They, they term it as mean because I dig deep and I find the loopholes. But in reality, 
in reality, when you get to the final five of The Apprentice, after 10 weeks of filming and going through all the things you need in business, all the skills, how to negotiate, how to buy, the final five have come through that. They've thought on their feet. Um, so they're all good, really. Yeah, but yeah. I have to, you know, me and the others have to find someone who's good enough good enough with the business plan it doesn't matter if it's not perfect it doesn't matter if there's mistakes in it has the idea got potential because yeah. potential is a very important word so business. linda you've touched on something i know i didn't want to ask any more questions but i have to ask this one you're being called the queen of me you know a lot of women are being called all sorts of labels and, and some of us hate it so much that we don't want to go there but you seem to not mind at all so what can you say to the people who are so afraid of the labels of the name? I calling? never know. Know who you are. You yes. have to have confidence in yourself. You know, if you have confidence in yourself, they call me the queen of mean, but I don't care because I know actually I'm not mean and I'm not a queen either. <laughs> but the truth is, I think if you, you've got to be true to yourself and that applies in business. And if you're true to yourself and you know who you are, what are lab what's labels? It's words, it's words, and it's mostly from jealous people. I mean, you know, or, um, or it's the newspapers, and I hate the, you know, I hate the fake news and the fake press, but being called the queen of mean let, made Alan Sugar know that he delivered the, I've delivered the brief that he wanted, yeah. you know, and then they want me to make candidates cry. They want me to make them unnerve them. And they, and then the candidates, I've, in fact, if any of potential candidates, I wrote it in my course, by my business course, I'll be in tough times when I have to interview them next year. Yes, yes. I, I touch on what they should be doing, you know. Yes, yeah. So it, the business course is for people who are starting now as well as. So the academy is, so the academy has got five offers. So in my academy, I've got an Ask Linda page. Um, I've written a business course, which actually is not launching. It's going to launch in about three weeks. It's just now having videos and being edited. And that is what I call 12 chapters to success. I've yeah. also written because I went on the BBC and I had to critique someone's CV. It was part of the um, yeah. your money and your life, right? And from that, I've had a lot of people get in touch with me. So I also offer a critique. I'll critique your CV. Um, I also, I've also done a, a financial template. I hate figures and I'm not really good at them. So I've done a financial template which they can buy, which they can, is good enough to take to a bank for investment. They can fill it all in and even if they can't, they can take it to someone and they can fill it all in. Um, and then I've done two other things, which, are, which is I would critique your business plan if you really want me to, if someone's got a really good business plan. And if you've got an idea, you can write to me and I'll give you feedback. Um, the course, the course, if people are out of work, the course, we've set it at a, a price that if people are out of work or people, I want to help people. I also yes. want to give yeah. back. So the, it's not just the course, it's an academy. It's got an Ask Linda page on and it's just something that I wanted to do. And that's now what I'm it's just, just getting out there. So lindaplant.com and people can see, you've seen it. There's videos I've done and there's bios I, about I highly it. recommend the course, I'm on there. <laughs> and I'm going to grow that. I'm going to grow it and grow the Ask Linda page. And then I'm going to do workshops and a lot of things that is in my vision when we can get back to. So will we get a special discount as for ladies? Yes, right? you will. You okay. will get a special discount. Anyone that, uh, anyone that buys the course on Forward Ladies will get a 15% discount. Wow, we just That's got that good. here. Thank you so much, Linda. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so, so much. Now we are just wrapping up now. If anybody has any more questions, um, yeah. Um, I will just take any final questions. If not, um, yeah, there's a question from Kerry. Will the Academy be useful if you're already a successful business? Yes, I think definitely. My, my course is not just for people starting a business. It's for people who've got a business and might need a bit of advice because as I say, every chapter I talk about 
what what I did and maybe those stories and my chapters will be useful to help them grow and help them go forward. I think anything Elinda does, if you go in there, you can only find value in it. So um, if you're thinking of investing yourself, you've been home, not traveling, if you're not furloughed, even if you're furloughed and you have some money, this is one of the things I say, we don't invest in ourselves. Well, enough. that's right. And I think and if, they go, if they go through PayPal, I think they can pay it off if they if they want to but if you look there's never been a better time because the truth is if you're furloughed if you've been made redundant if you've got an idea because the truth is job security if you're out of a job and you're looking for another job we don't know how secure it's going to be during this time do we so it's never a better time to actually have a go fantastic Oh, thank you. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, a recording of this session will be available on YouTube um, for you to watch again. Um, thank you for making time for us, Linda. I, a I, pleasure. I'm just so grateful for everything. You're so inspiring, so energetic, and you give us so much. Um, thank you. Over. Well, I hope all the ladies, all the women out there who have watched this, I hope I've added a little bit of inspiration brightness whatever good story to their lives and you know just just don't give up for john because that's what we women have to do yes so, and if you're not a member of the forward ladies community already yeah. why are you not please go to the website and sign up as a free member and if as they, a premium member yeah and if they buy the course um, which is on pre-launch and they just put forward ladies then they'll get 15 percent off that fabulous fabulous so so that's it from me and that's it from linda and thank you all so much Thanks. have a lovely day Griselda. thank you so much it's always a pleasure to talk to you to support you and to support forward ladies yeah, I think some people can't resist showing their faces. They just want you to see them. I can't. <laughs> okay, yeah, so we'll ask everyone to turn your cameras on. Since I'm everyone wants to, to be seen, them. turn all your cameras on. <laughs> and let's do a final goodbye. How do I see them? Yeah, um, you need to click on your uh, the view. And then you see uh, everyone. Great. So we've got, oh, yes. It, this is fabulous. Yeah. I'll just take a picture. Them, yes. <laughs> oh, we've got pages and pages. Thank you so much. Um, we're incredible. We are, we're strong. We can do anything. Nobody can take that away from yeah, us. Yeah, remember, you can do anything. I've been through, so I've been through great times and shit times. You get through it all. <laughs> Thanks, Griselda. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Bye, ladies. Bye. 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 Um, I'm going to go off now. Yes. If I can know how to leave it, leave. Just a red button. <laughs>